Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star and the number one on your phone to ask a question. I would now like to turn the conference over to Chad Edinger. Thank you, and you may begin. Thank you. I'm excited to welcome everyone to our first KnowledgeWorks webinar, partnering with TANF for employment services for non-custodial parents. KnowledgeWorks is a set of resources for child support-led employment programs. The KnowledgeWorks resources are located on the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement's website. If you go to our homepage, you could select the Child Support Professional tab at the top, then select the drop-down Working With, then Working With Employment Programs, and that'll bring you to our KnowledgeWorks landing page. Uh, a quick note, by this Friday, November 22nd, you'll be able to register for our next webinar, Reinvesting Child Support Incentive Payments and Section 1115 Waivers for Employment Services for Noncustodial Parents. That webinar will be provided on March 2nd by Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin. I also want to take a quick minute to mention that the KnowledgeWorks resources will soon include a map identifying each state that currently operates an employment program for noncustodial parents, and it'll share some key operational details of each state's program. Please note that NCCSD, the National Council for Child Support Directors, will be reissuing a survey later today to all state directors related to that map. All right, back to our webinar, partnering with TANF for employment services for noncustodial parents. Before I introduce our speakers, I just want to take a second to frame this topic. Did you know over 11 billion dollars of current support due to families went uncollected last year? Did you know our child support core enforcement tools aren't working for about a third of non-custodial parents? Did you know many of these employment services are not eligible for child support federal financial participation? Did you know TANF funds can support employment services for non-custodial parents? Did you know any TANF funds potentially used would not be considered in determining a state's cost-effectiveness ratio for child support incentive payments? Imagine creating a partnership between child support and TANF in your state to collaborate to enroll non-custodial parents in employment services and job training programs. You don't have to imagine. You're about to hear from Colorado and Maryland about how they have done exactly that. From Colorado, you're going to hear from Michelle Barnes, the Executive Director of Department of Human Services, Key Powell, Director of Office of Economic Security, Larry Dabian, Director of Child Support Services Division, and Catherine Smith, Director of Employment and Benefits Division. From Maryland, Department of Human Services, you'll hear from Kevin Gustwhite, Executive Director of Child Support Administration, Netsonic Cabret, the Executive Director of the Family Investment Administration, Dawn Coleman, Assistant Director for Talbot County Department of Social Services, Office of Child Support, and Vernon Wallace, Responsible Fatherhood Manager, Center for Urban Families. And lastly, we also are joined by Antoinette Kitchen from the Office of Family Assistance, Division of State, TANF Policy, in case we have any federal-related um, TANF questions. Without uh, further hesitation, I will turn it over to Michelle Barnes, the Executive Director of Colorado Department of Human Services. Thank you, Chad. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm really happy to be part of this. Um, in Colorado and at the Colorado Department of Human Services, we have a partnership between Child Support Services and TANF programs to utilize TANF dollars. These programs provide employment with supportive services for parents with child support obligation. It also helps to provide necessary resources and services to thousands of parents who are willing to pay for their child support but currently are unable to do so. And this work aligns well with the existing work in the Employment and Benefits Division to provide employment services to recipients of Colorado Basic Cash Assistance, which is TANF, and other CDHS programs that provide employment to uh, Colorado citizens. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you, and I hope we can all learn from each other in pursuit of supporting these vulnerable populations through employment programs. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues to talk a little more about what we're doing in Colorado. Thank you, Michelle. If we go to the next slide, please. 
So the goal of this webinar is to share um, some of the great work that is being done um, collaboratively here in Colorado to connect parents to employment uh, resources and su other supportive services. And we will share with you um, some of the data that we've learned that has really inspired our work and how we are uh, working with our um, TANF partners to um, put in um, place some employment um, services. So um, next slide, please. So this is the why, um, why this information, why this, these programs are so critical. And I know when, um, when I have um, discussed these kinds of issues with my colleagues, uh, other state child support directors, I think most states have a pretty good sense of this, that uh, in Colorado, we have uh, 90,000 parents um, and who owe a current monthly child support obligation and families that could greatly benefit from receiving those child support payments. Unfortunately, um, 30,000 families, nearly a third of those families every month, go without a dollar of child support payments. And we have um, you know, a wealth of enforcement remedies to help uh, motivate payment behavior for those parents that have an ability to pay child support. But what we're learning is that those um, remedies um, cannot motivate a parent to pay their support if they don't have the ability to pay the support, if they don't have a job, if they're facing a variety of barriers. barriers. So that's something that um, really has guided our work with um, in the Colorado Department of Human Services. This is impactful not only to families to not be able to receive this child support payment, it also has a negative impact in terms of a state's performance in our percent of current child support collected uh, measurement. Um, nationally, I'm, I pulled up some data over the last federal, three federal fiscal years, the percent of current support collected on a national basis has been stagnant, it's been stuck in the 65.6% mm -hmm. range. So if we keep doing things the same way that we've been doing them, we're gonna to continue to get the same results. So that really is what has motivated our work. Next slide, please. This is some data um, that um, is available from our Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement. I've included uh, information data for both Colorado and the national average, but every state data, uh, every state has provided this information so you can kind of see how you compare with regard to the percent of current support collected. And I've, this slide breaks out between, um, for current TANF cases, uh, families are currently receiving um, TANF, in Colorado, we are only collecting 36% of the total amount due for federal fiscal year 2017. The national average is 35%. Uh, for former TANF cases, and for those who are not in the child support program, um, continued services are provided to a um, family once they discontinue from receiving TANF. Um, only 59% of the total amount due is paid, which is a slight increase, but certainly not where we would like to see it. The national average is 57%. And then for the never TANF cases, 70% in Colorado of that, that child support due is paid, and the national average is 71%. So I'm gonna pose a question to all of you that are listening in on this webinar and participating. What if 20% of our parents who are, who are willing to pay their child support but currently unable to do so, had the resources and the, uh, and the employment services and other supportive services to deal with employment issues economic issues, mental health, substance abuse, if they were to receive comprehensive services, in Colorado we've calculated that would be an extra $15 million in current support to families. And I guess the challenge that, um, that I would encourage all states to do is to have these discussions that we're gonna share with you here today. Next slide, please. Yeah, so thank you. This is Kiki Powell from Colorado. Um, and I kinda wanna go back and touch on a couple of uh, points that Larry made. I think this hamster wheel is a perfect example of sometimes it feels like uh, we could be on this trajectory and yet it feels like we're just kind of spinning our wheels. We're going through the motions. And we've had the child support system long enough to know that over times when we've seen major gains in our child support systems, those have been um, built on a few things. Mm -hmm. Some has been automating the remedies, mm -hmm. right? So it makes it easier for us to enforce uh, uh, you contributing your child support. Some of that has been data system enhancements, right? Making it easier for us to find mm -hmm. uh, non-custodial parents. And some of that has been policy making decisions, right? Um, including things like moving to zero dollar issuances, mm -hmm. right? So across the states, if we lower the amount that is required, we could perhaps start seeing an increase in the percent that's mm -hmm. actually um, being received. 
And so when we look at our, the history of our system, and as Larry just mentioned, we're at this place where we're, we're experiencing some stagnation, I think we really need to reinvent uh, how we're approaching some of our efforts. So if you go to the next slide, I think that this slide is really important because it helps us really frame um, the nature of the problem we're trying to tackle. You know, originally child support was built on the mechanism or the, the theory, right, that people had a high ability to pay but a low desire. And that's where enforcement remedies make a ton of sense, right? It, we need to somehow make it difficult for you to not pay. Um, excuse me, to not not pay, excuse me. Um, but in the world that we're dealing with, I think our enforcement remedies are incredibly effective for that population. Where they're not effective is in this different population, right? Where you might actually have the desire or a high desire to pay, but a low ability. And I think that's pretty consistent with the earlier slide that Larry shared when we're looking at the percentage collected um, across the current TANF caseload, the former TANF caseload, and then the never TANF caseload. Why are those so fundamentally different? Well, I think we have some answers to that question. Um, and through, uh, I think at the end, we'll actually share a timeline slide mm -hmm. of a slew of efforts that Colorado has put in place to try to understand the nature of this uh, problem a little bit more, but also the strategies. So if we go to the next slide, um, Larry will talk a little bit about a couple of the employment and the engagement strategies that we have been using here to, again, understand the nature of this problem and create the right solutions. Thank you, Kee. We um, have been working for a number of years now on uh, a number of different strategies of how to improve the collection rate of current support. And a piece that we felt was important is to not just get all the smart people in the child support program together in a room and try to identify what we might do differently, but we decided we wanted to learn from our customers and our stakeholders. And this slide um, demonstrates some of what we learned. Um, as part of this project, uh, we surveyed um, parents. We did focus groups with parents, both the receivers of child support, the payers of child support. We asked judges and magistrates. We asked child support directors in other states. Um, attorneys, um, private attorneys, and 4D attorneys, and also child support professionals that do the work day in and day out, and asked them to share with us what they felt needed to be done to increase the consistency of child support payments. And this is what we learned. Um, one of the things that you, um, you can see on this slide is the need to address family situations. We heard um, loud and clear from our um, parents that a one-size-fits-all policy does not work. and Colorado, like many other states, I think, um, did a, um, a, almost too good of a job in terms of automating all of our enforcement remedies mm -hmm. so that the system would calculate uh, when a parent would be eligible for that particular remedy and automatically throw them into that remedy, and then we would wait for a response from the parent once they got a notice that their driver's license was going to be suspended or some other enforcement remedy was going to take place. And what parents shared with us is, let's, let's use the right tools and let's Let's um, not use a one-size-fits-all. So we'll share with you today some of the work we're doing in terms of you know, making smart decisions when we st first get involved in working with a, um, a family on a child support case about whether or not it's appropriate for the remedies to go forward. So some of the other feedback that we heard um, from parents is that they need assistance navigating the complicated child support system. For those of us that are in the program, we get it, uh, but it takes a while for us to really um, understand that. Um, so it's critical that we take the time um, at the front end with parents and not just rely on notices that are sent out that have complicated legalese, but actually take the time to have conversations with parents and share with them um, what's involved in the child support system and how we can work together collaboratively relating to that. So um, next slide, please. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about some work we've been doing in Colorado in terms of getting some um, um, budget requests and some dollars. So thank you. Hi, this is Kathy Smith. I am the Division Director for the Employment and Benefits Division, which uh, oversees our Colorado TANF program, as well as several other employment programs in Colorado, um, to include our uh, TANF workforce uh, program. So looking at uh, the past, uh, the CDHS and the Division of Child Support Services had previously done two attempts um, to try to get some funds and those were state general fund requests. 
Uh, and the hope in getting those funds was to be able to beef up some of these employment services that we can provide to our child support um, families. And those were actually uh, not successful attempts. And so it was a, a decision as, as an office of economic security uh, to come back to the table and really determine what could we do the third time around to make this more successful. Uh, and so the Division of Child Support Services and the Employment and Benefits Division partnered together to really look at how we could get this requested through TANF uh, federal funds rather than the state general funds. And we were able to look at the four purposes of TANF and determine that uh, the services that we wanted to provide as it related to employment uh, fit under those four purposes of TANF. Um, and so that third attempt that we were able to make requesting full TANF funds um, was successful. And then if you want to move on to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about some of the data that was used to help the success in that as well. Uh, so the first two times we used uh, our, our rates for our COPEP program, uh, which had results, but it didn't have data on the enhanced services versus our control group. Uh, so we worked with uh, Arapahoe County, which is a uh, local county in Colorado that also has a, a program that is similar to what we wanted to implement here with the IMPACTS program. Uh, we were able to use some of their data, which is shown here, on the increased employment that they saw through what they call um, their, their Parents to Work program. And using some of that data, we were able to really support um, that budget request and the need and justification to utilize TANF dollars to get that third attempt approved. Uh, the next slide, and Larry will speak some of this um, on the Colorado Parent Employment Program, um, but that right side there really kind of just details out the specifics around the budget request that was submitted, um, the amount we requested for four years at four and a half million dollars, um, our goal of serving the 10,000 families over a three-year period. Um, the cost came out to about $300 per participant, mm -hmm. uh, and that really would be focusing on not only employment services, but other classes, workshops, things like that, that we could make available to strengthening our families, increasing engagement, um, and all of those things. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Colorado was fortunate to be one of the um, eight states that were able to participate in the National Child Support Non-Custodial Parent Empl Employment Demonstration Program known as CSPEN. In Colorado, we called that the Colorado Parent Employment Project, or better known as COPEP. And that was really our first venture into providing these types of services um, for parents. And through the, the four counties that we worked with, um, with regard to that grant that are listed here on, on the slide on the left-hand side, we designed um, a different way of doing business. We de designed a way mm -hmm. for those parents that were um, willing to pay their child support, but currently had an inability to do so. We wanted to have comprehensive services. Um, some of those services included uh, fatherhood classes. Um, many of the participants were um, young fathers that maybe um, had not had great role modeling as they were growing up in terms of what that was um, being a father was about. So it included fatherhood classes. Uh, we did suspension of some of the enforcement remedies to give the opportunity for parents to get on their feet, get con connected to resources before any enforcement remedies um, would kick in. Um, we also participated in a rare compromise in, in, mm -hmm. as a, uh, in exchange for engaged participation, not in exchange for payment, but engaged mm -hmm. participation mm -hmm. with the work uh, with COPEP. We also um, did um, a lot of employment supports. And in each of the four counties, um, I, I think a key piece of the success was this, is that we had navigators. We had someone designated um, in the county to be the navigator for those parents. And they received referrals from child support professionals in their office. But I think a, a key piece of this, that what we've learned is it's important or there will be someone that is very knowledgeable, very dedicated to this and able to connect parents to the resources um, that are available in the community. So that really got us jazzed about why this um, program can make a difference and resulted in um, eventually our success, as Kathy mentioned, in terms of the um, budget request um, for 
um, what we call improvement payments and child success uh, impacts that are listed here on this slide as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. A few years ago, um, our executive director, whose name was Reggie Bika, still, his name still is Reggie Bika, but <laughs> he um, was a, a fellow at the Ascend um, uh, at Aspen Institute um, that really focuses on two generational transformation of human services programs. And he spoke to um, folks in the Department of Human Services and asked for programs to volunteer to, um, to learn about two generational approaches, which really is about working with the whole family, the whole family getting them connected to uh, resources. And Child Support volunteered for that, and we thought it was something that we would like to um, um, jump into um, full speed. And we've really approached this in a, in a scientific way in terms of our, our work with our two-generational approach. Uh, we worked with um, some pilot counties. Uh, we worked with a University of Northern Colorado professor to, and parents and county child support folks to develop something called a family resource assessment that, um, that would, um, and the way we utilize this is that we asked parents in their, some of their initial contacts and in working with the, the participating county child support offices to answer some questions. Would they be able to pay their child support? Um, what barriers might they face in terms of uh, an ability um, to pay their child support? And then we tracked payment compliance as a result of that. And, and, and working with the University of Northern Colorado, we learned some very interesting things um, in response to that that actually had um, significant impact in terms of a parent's ability to pay child support. And the first one is um, a parent who reports having a felony or even a misdemeanor conviction has a decreased likelihood of paying their child support by 86%. And uh, the majority of um, parents I know in our COPEP um, project um, were formerly incarcerated. And so as a child support program, it's really imperative that we figure out ways for working with that population of the caseload. And we figure out a way how to work with employers in the community that um, are, are willing to hire folks with, uh, with a, with a um, criminal conviction. So that was something we learned. Um, we also learned that um, access to transportation was another barrier um, to employment associated with risk. In fact, it decreased the likelihood to pay by 68%. Well, what's one of the rep primary remedies for child support? Driver's license suspension. So by doing that, um, that takes away um, a parent, for many parents, an ability for a parent to get to work, to be able to pay their child support. So. Um, a big piece of what we're working on in terms of our uh, 2GN transformation is to make good decisions on the front end that if a parent is facing barriers, they're motivated to um, overcome those, let's don't suspend their driver's license right off the bat. Let's be smart and work with the parent and give them the opportunity to um, get back on their feet before um, those remedies might um, be plugged back in. And we also learned that for every barrier to employment reported by a parent um, with a child support obligation, the odds of paying decreased by 34 to 38%. So that was the first phase of our two-generational approach, working with our county partners to give us data so that we know um, what are those factors that we know absolutely impact the uh, parent's ability to pay child support. And our contact information is listed at the end of the, um, the presentation. And if, and if, Anyone on this webinar would like to have a copy of that, the one pager or the full report um, from that, I'd be happy to share that. Next slide, please. Right, so this is Kiki again. I um, wanna describe a, a little bit and take this moment to really outline that what you see here is that in phase two, we use that information from the assessment and we started incorporating that into the day-to-day -day work, right? So instead of perhaps showing up and us doing an income calculation and saying, best of luck, you know, hope you, hope you pay your child support on time, um, by engaging in that kind of lengthier conversation, really trying to figure out where parents are, um, we wanted to see if we could just put some easy tools in place for counties that, and, and see what kind of impact they would have. So using the assessment up front, we engaged uh, 420 parents across the state, 210 of them served in this uh, more, what I wanna call familial friendly model or family friendly model. 
Um, and we actually made funds available at a $200 per uh, parent in order to provide them some supportive services. We had 11 pilot counties across the um, state participate. This is a picture of us uh, celebrating a year of that effort. Um, and this was this past summer. And if you go to the next slide, what I, I really, th this day where um, you just saw the picture of us, we just kind of went around a circle and said, like, what, was, what were some of the things you learned? Um, and this was one of the days where I will say I got to kind of fill my cup in my job. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also a day I might have left teary-eyed, mm -hmm. um, but in a happy way. Um, because just, I thought it was really interesting and cool that while I think what we're trying to do is enhance the experience for families and children, uh, indirectly or directly, maybe, we've enhanced the experience of the workforce. Um, and so these are just a couple of comments from some of the workers that uh, had participated in this effort. And I think for them, it was just a huge culture and mind shift. Um, and I think also can lead to a degree of increased satisfaction in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So if every day I have to show up, and the nature of my work is to fuss at people or have people fuss at me, um, I would not say that would be high on my list of how I want my work day to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, if the nature of the interaction is positive, and in one case, um, I, I love this last quote, because I said to the child support worker, you might be doing too good of a job <laughs> if this person wants to come hang out with you on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, but I thought that was a lovely thing, right? Like, no longer were we an entity that a parent wanted to avoid, but rather an entity that they felt was a support in their system, so much so that they felt that they wanted to make sure that their friends understood the change and the dynamic and were referring people to our program. So to me, I would describe this slightly as an employment or supportive strategy, but I would actually describe our, our to gen work more as an engagement strategy. Mm -hmm. How do we engage our child support families differently than we have historically? Absolutely. And we can go to the next slide, actually. So this is Kathy Smith again. Uh, the next slide really touches on a successful employment strategy that we've had here in Colorado um, and one that we would want to draw on. Um, in some of the work that we are going to continue to do with our child support population. Um, so Rehire Colorado is not focused specifically on our child support participants, rather um, on Coloradans as a whole um, who have barriers to getting employment. Uh, so the program is uh, to help individuals uh, with barriers, like I said, to employment re-enter the workforce uh, by combining wage paid work, job skills, training, and supportive services. Um, so through rehire, uh, an assessment is done uh, in order to really identify what skills uh, the individual has that they're bringing to the table, what areas could we work with them on building skills. Um, and then they're partnered with the case manager to complete career assessment, um, get supportive services in place, set goals, and then get into a transitional job where they're able to start to um, earn some wages. And so the case manager is working really closely with um, connected employers in the community, um, set them up with interviews, uh, send them to career events, things like that, uh, in order to get them permanent employment. We've seen a lot of success with our rehire program. Uh, 2,000, uh, over 2,000 participants across the state, um, and we will be continuing that uh, over the next four years as well um, in, our, in our plans. So if you want to go to the next two slides, actually, um, I won't go into these in too great of detail, uh, but really, uh, sorry, can you go back one slide? Um, that This slide here really just shows the dotted line. Um, uh, the quarters and earnings for these individuals relative to when they started the rehire program. And you can see quite a significant jump um, in, in their quarterly wage earnings, which, as we know, um, helps them get self-sufficient and then um, really helps to motivate them to pay their, their current support. The next slide uh, is another uh, graph that really just goes through 
um, the treatment, which would be our rehire population, and then looking at the rest of the general population, which is the control group. And you can see that um, we've got wages that um, are showing up higher than, than our general control group. If you go to the next slide, I think this is um, part of what I want to talk about. Larry mentioned this earlier about the inf uh, enforcement remedies. We can't use a one-size-fits-all approach. And I want to say that that is the same um, scenario with employment strategies. Mm -hmm. So the, pro the point of us highlighting uh, the rehire program and also our newly uh, created program, the IMPACTS program, is that the costs of those two programs are vastly different. Mm -hmm. And the strategies involved to working with non-custodial uh, parents, excuse me, is vastly different. In our rehire program, that is really a subsidized employment model. And we know that subsidized employment models cost anywhere from, you know, 5000 to 6000 sometimes up, upwards of $8,000 per person. Um, we know that they are evidence and very effective strategies for people who have been out of the labor market for a while. And at the same time, when you recall how Larry started out this presentation, uh, we have 30,000 families uh, on a monthly basis that aren't getting a payment. We don't have 30,000, you know, times 5,400, I can't even do that math, right, you know, to, to tackle that problem. And so I, I think what we in Colorado have been grappling with are um, what are economically feasible strategies. That's part of the reason in our third attempt uh, to go ask for funding. I think we were more successful because I think we, we started to think a little more strategically about what are feasible, uh, economically feasible strategies for us to tackle, um, and also what are we capable of doing in our current workforce? Um, child support doesn't currently run a subsidized employment model mm -hmm. out of their, you know, out of their, uh, you know, divisions, part, departments, buildings. So how far aligned or misaligned are those kinds of activities? Because I think we got to get strategic. And this is where um, I really want to emphasize, um, you know, you're seeing in front of you a slide that goes all the way back to 2013. And what I want to say to you, if you're a state on the phone today and you're thinking like, gosh, this sounds really cool, but how would we ever get there? I, I want to say it's 2019, it's almost mm -hmm. 2020, and we've been on this journey for near seven years, right? So I would, if you have to start somewhere and you don't have a lot of funds, the first place actually I think Colorado would recommend to you is how can you engage your population differently than you're doing today? That usually costs very little to no money, right? Like, how do we just have a conversation with families about what their situations might be and what kind of supports exist in the world today that we could get them access to? Next step as a state might be something like, do we have resources on hand that we're not fully utilizing? Like our TANF dollars, for instance, or the workforce employment programs that exist in your community. And then I think the bold steps that we've taken to create our own employment programs um, are something that we are now, you know, in year seven just kicking off. So I don't want anyone on the call today to feel like, oh, that's where I have to start. It's, it, I would say, no, 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 this is where we're ending up, and, and, and our journey's not done, but seven years into the process is when we finally have been successful to, to crack this nut. The other thing that I just want to mention that I would be remiss in not mentioning um, is that I think that we started this conversation also talking about that a lot of our strategies are targeted at our uh, current TANF population and our former TANF population because they are paying at a fundamentally different rate than our mm -hmm. never TANF population. And one thing that I also want to emphasize when you're looking at this slide, um, and it is in the purple, is, is pass-through. Mm -hmm. I would highly recommend to going to Colorado's website. Um, we have a webinar about our 100% pass-through uh, legislation that we had passed that was funded by the General Assembly to ensure that all the dollars that non-custodial parents are sending to their children through our child support system are actually getting to their children and not being taken and given back to the government. Um, we had to get money through our General Assembly to do that, but I think it is the complement of that policy plus 
the new engagement strategies plus employment strategies that are um, changing the way that we're starting to see some of our payment. Very well stated, Kiki. Let's go to the next slide, please. We wanted to share the, some comments from parents, and what we're really trying to do is to have the child support program be one that parents come to for support and assistance instead of run away from. We've done a lot over the years to encourage mm -hmm. parents to run away from us by having just an enforcement-based approach. And the one thing I like about the, the second quote at the bottom is that um, this parent, his, his experience had been a very negative experience. And, um, and he was so heartwarmed by the fact that um, they want to work, that the county child support office, I believe it was Montrose County on the Western Slope here in Colorado, a parent that shared this, that wanted to work with them. Um, didn't want to just say, oh, you're just another case, but really work with him on an individual basis. And so much of this work, um, as Kee mentioned, is better engagement with our families and a real culture shift with our, with our county um, child support professionals. We've had parents come to our annual conference and share mm -hmm. their experiences and that there was not a dry eye in the room because the county folks um, re realized that, you know, these are families, these are individuals, and by providing these types of services, um, it's going to be a win-win for everybody. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is our last slide, actually, um, and I just think this is such an important story. This is a picture of Juan and his two children. They were featured in a Denver Post article, um, and had, Juan had participated in our um, parent employment mm -hmm. program. And Juan's story, you know, starts out with us in that he is um, in his 20s, he's making $13 an hour, and he's repeati repeatedly missing his $650 payment a month in child support. And frankly, it wasn't realistic. He was never going to get ahead. In fact, at the time that he, uh, his story starts with us, um, he owes $17,000 in arrears. Um, I don't know about you, but if I had a $17,000 bill that I had to pay, I would find that incredibly overwhelming, and I am not working a minimum wage job. Mm -hmm. um, and when Juan's story uh, starts with us, unfortunately, he had a SWAT team show up at the hotel that he was working at in order to arrest him for not consistently paying child support. And I will go back to, you know, some of the earlier slides that we started with. Juan's desire to pay was there, but his ability to keep up with those payments was not. And, in, and he was working, but he was working in a job where at the rate he needed to pay, he was not going to get ahead. Um, we have been able to work with Juan, uh, participated in our parent employment program, able to uh, pay his $17,000 uh, debt off, also um, able to uh, get his insurance adjuster license and boost his job potential. So these are the kinds of stories in Colorado that we are working towards. Um, and I'm really incredibly proud of the work that we've done, but also really um, remind all of us, including ourselves, that this has been a journey, and it's not something that we do overnight. But um, if you're interested in that journey, um, we are here to continue to support those conversations mm -hmm. because we're incredibly proud of the journey and the impact that it's having on people like Juan and his children. And with that, I think we're ending the Colorado presentation, and Michelle and Chad will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Key Operator. If we can um, see if there's any questions, please. We will now begin our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star and the number one on your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star two. One moment as we wait for any questions. Our first question comes from Donna Steele. Your line is open. Hi. So somebody from Colorado 
Um, you gave us statistics around job retention, and for the purposes of the project, do you know how you defined job retention? Hi, Donna, this is Ki. Sorry, we're each looking um, through the slides, and I apologize. When you said job retention, um, I think in each of our employment programs that is definitely a function that we have looked at. I don't know that I have the specifics of between rehire and COPEP, um, what, what those percentages were. Hold on one second, we're looking at something. Okay, got it. So I think we were looking at the Arapaho uh, County Parents to Work program. So go ahead, what was your question again, Donna? I'm sorry. So my question is how did you define job retention? Oh, good question. Um, I don't, we don't have that specific definition on hand. Typically, it's usually about six months, but we can get that information uh, and answer mm -hmm. that in the FAQ afterwards for the webinar. Awesome, thank you. Our next question comes from Keisha Gorm. Your line is open. Hi, could you talk a little bit more about the arrears adjustment? Yes, happy to. When, as part of our involvement with the CSPED um, 1115 demonstration grant, um, when we reached out with parents, we, um, in, in terms of trying to engage their participation, we um, to provide a little bit of a, of a carrot for those cases that had TANF arrears, assigned arrears that were owed for a time period that the um, other parent or caretaker had received TANF. We offered uh, an exchange, and, and it, it wasn't 100% as of a specific time, but it was like over a three-month period that 25% could be um, 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 mitigated. mitigated in exchange for active, engaged participation. And when we worked with our county, our four counties that were part of that, they were um, absolutely engaged in the discussion and setting that policy. Um, okay, so it was specifically for TANF arrears. Yes, yes, we certainly do not have the authority to um, compromise arrears owed to the custodial party. But I can tell you there were some stories in our COPEP work that um, custodial parties were so jazzed by the idea that we were working with their parents and he and that the, the payer of child support was working toward an ability to pay their child support mm -hmm. that there were stories where there was um, a willingness on some, some of either the non-assigned child support arrears to write that off because they were just excited to see that there was gonna be a possibility down the road for getting consistent payments. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question comes from Laura Van Buskirk. Your line is open. Hi there, one of your slides mentioned the $300 per participant for your supportive services. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that money was spent, so what you were actually paying for, with those supportive services dollars and how the determination was made for when you would um, expend those funds for each participant? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the $300 uh, was in part, so part of the way we came to that amount, first of all, I wanna go back and acknowledge Arapahoe County's great work here. Mm -hmm. They're actually spending, I think it's roughly $150 per participant. We are less experienced in running the employment, pro employment program or supportive services program in that way. So we, we didn't know that we would be that efficient with mm -hmm. the dollar yet. Yeah. So we overshot a little bit just on purpose to say, we might not be as good as getting down to 150. Um, your question about what is that spent on? It can be a variety of things. Um, Sometimes if we see a barrier like transportation and that's in the car needs to be fixed or the tire needs to be bought, um, sometimes it's in the clothing that are related to employment. We need work boots. Um, we need a tool, you know, we need some tools. So it's those types of things that's at an individual level mm -hmm. that the, depending on your language, the navigator, the caseworker, mm -hmm. the whomever, sits down with the client, assesses what those barriers are, and can use those funds strategically to eliminate some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. Larry, what else do you want to add there? I think you nailed it, Kiki. That's exactly it. And with regard to our impacts program, we're actually working with our community and county partners um, in, in terms of responding to a request for information to help us in terms of designing what that's going to look like. But those are absolutely the types of costs that we want to make those dollars available to support parents' efforts. Great, thank you. There are no additional questions in queue at this time. 
Um, this is Michelle. I am having technical difficulties on my end. Um, is it any way that you could make Chad the person to change the slides because I'm having technical difficulties. It's not going to the next slide. I'm getting an error message. Chad, you are now presenter. Chad? Yes, I was just checking if it worked on my side. Sorry, everyone, for those uh, technical difficulties. Um, now that we've heard Colorado present, we are going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Maryland. Um, Kevin Gustwhite, if you're available, please uh, proceed with your part of the presentation. All right, well, thank you, Chad. If you want to go ahead to the next slide. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Secretary Lourdes Padilla of the Maryland Department of Human Services, we thank the Federal Administration for Children and Families and Office of Child Support Enforcement for hosting this webinar, and we are honored to be invited to present along with Colorado. And thank you to all the attendees who have joined us today to learn more about our effective strategic partnerships between TANF and child support, providing employment services to non-custodial parents. Next slide, please. I am Kevin Geisway, and I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Child Support Administration within the Department of Human Services. And as Chad had mentioned earlier, presenting with me today is Nisana Cabret, who is the Executive Director of the Maryland Family Investment Administration, Don Coleman, who is the Assistant Director of the Talbot County Department of Social Services Office of Child Support, which is located on Maryland's Eastern Shore, and Vernon Wallace, the Responsible Fatherhood Manager with the Center for Urban Families, who is one of our many program partners that supports our TANF Child Support Partnerships, and more importantly, the families and children that we serve. Next slide, please. So for over the next 30 minutes, we're going to share with you about Maryland's strategic partnerships between TANF and child support. And our partnership really begins under the leadership and direction of Maryland Governor Larry Hogan and Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, along with Secretary Lourdes Padilla. Both Governor Hogan and Secretary Padilla strongly support a whole family approach to the families that we serve. As non-custodial parents have a strong desire to work and be involved in their children's life, this is how Maryland is looking at all of our policies and informing our approach to expanding the programs that we have to support the families that we serve. The direction of the Maryland Department of Human Services, including all three administrations, that includes social services, which is our child welfare, our family investment, which manages our TANF programs, and of course, child support, is exemplified through our shared dedication to meeting the governor's and secretary's goals. We're going to share the following as a way of explaining Maryland's approach to TANF Child Support Partnership as outlined on the slide. It starts with a two-generational approach to coordinate and align our services, our policies, and systems to improve outcomes for the whole family. Maryland utilizes the University of Maryland School of Social Work, who has for over 20 years conducted a longitudinal study on our TANF clients, which helps help to inform our approach and base our decisions on empirical research data. Additionally, we regularly meet with a committee that consists of key stakeholders across the state of Maryland, including uh, delegates and senators from the Maryland General Assembly, advocates and program partners to help discuss and drive some of our policy decisions, particularly around low income and those with uh, challenges with paying support. Our workforce development and non custodial parent employment programs are key examples of how our two-gen approach involves the whole family by assisting both custodial and non custodial parents and their children. We will share some details of these programs and end our conversation with some of the lessons learned as well as future plans for how we want to include the integration of our systems under the Maryland Total Human Services Integrated Network, or MD Think, through one cloud-based platform. Next slide, please. This map shows the footprint for Maryland in our offices that we have throughout the state. The Maryland Department of Human Services has local offices in all 24 jurisdictions. Social Services and Family Investment are all included in all the departments of social services, with child support offices located in 19 of the local departments. The four large metropolitan child support offices are separate standalone operations from the departments of social services, but they network and partner together to ensure efficiency and success across the offices. The Baltimore City Office of Child Support Services, which is the largest metropolitan office in Maryland, has two office locations to best meet the needs of families within the zip codes with the highest concentration of customers. This office is privatized and operated by Veritas HHS. The Child Support Administration works closely with Veritas 
to address the needs specific to Baltimore City. Additionally, we collaborate with the Family Investment Administration on shared workforce and non-custodial parent programs, utilizing all TANF funding. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation to Natana Cabret, Executive Director of the Family Investment Administration, who will share about the two-generation approach in Maryland and how workforce development programs support the approach. Next slide, please. Thank you, Kevin. In 2017, Governor Hogan signed an executive order directing the state to study multi-generational poverty and to consider adopting a two-gen approach as a better way of doing business. Last year, a commission chaired by Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford recommended adopting a statewide two-gen approach. Under this approach, we're updating the way that we serve clients. Instead of serving individuals through programs and services, we serve the entire family, intentionally working towards better outcomes for both parents and children with an emphasis on economic self-sufficiency and well-being. Next slide, please. Here's a snapshot of what the two-gen approach looks like in practice in Maryland as it is being implemented, and we'll highlight just a few of these. Maryland has taken a number of steps to lessen the impact of the benefits cliff effect and incentivize new employment or promotional opportunities without fear of an immediate loss of one's TANF benefit. Last year, Governor Hogan expanded the Child Care Subsidy Program, which effectively doubled the income cap for a family of four. On July 1st of this year, DHS implemented a child support pass-through benefit that adds up to $100 uh, for one child, or up to $200 for two or more children for each on-time full child support payment onto the custodial parent's TANF benefit. Three, also effective July 1st, we now offer a transitional TANF benefit to families who have become ineligible due to income. This transitional benefit is an additional three months of the TANF cash benefit. And four, Maryland has one of the highest reimbursable earned income tax credits, which is a proven intervention for interrupting poverty. And last year, that credit was increased to 28%. We mentioned earlier Maryland's combined workforce development system. In some parts of the state, we are, develop, we are delivering TANF and WEO services out of the same locations and layering on additional supports as necessary for the families served, such as emergency food pantries. We also wanted to highlight the Opioid Operational Command Center, which coordinates 12 state agencies with local governments, community and faith-based programs, and other partners to provide necessary interventions for families impacted by the opioid crisis. Maryland is piloting innovative two-gen approaches to serving whole families, including a pilot for student parents who are receiving TANF through Prince George's Community College. And finally, we're embracing a no-wrong-door culture throughout state agencies so that families have a positive experience seeking out services and are referred seamlessly for other programs that they may not know about. Next slide, please. We talked about what we have already done to implement a two-gen approach statewide, but there's also a lot on the horizon that will impact TANF child support service delivery. Briefly, some of the changes to come, including enhancing vendor expectations so that our partners are incorporating the whole family approach to their work and are encouraged to work across systems and programs. We're building out additional transitional supports for families who are moving out of assistance programs and into self-sufficiency. We're changing the culture and climate of how we do the work and expanding our frame of reference from a compliance-based mindset, which is important, to a coaching-based mindset. There are process outcomes tied to that so that all of our staff buy in and understand the value. Finally, there's a new project launching this fall between Maryland's community action agencies and our local departments of social services to use a two-gen approach to serving families jointly and in an intentional way. Next slide, please. When a client walks into any of our local departments of social services, we assess their needs holistically and then connect them with available resources. A customer may apply and access the following services shown on this slide depending upon their needs. Child welfare and adult protective services are also integrated into our client-centered service, client service model. And while nutrition education is not a service embedded within our local departments of social services, our food stamp nutrition education partner conducts outreach directly within the local. Next slide, please. Right. As mentioned earlier, Maryland observed the combined workforce development plan bringing together the programs and grants shown on this slide. Titles one through three programs are administered by the Maryland Department of Labor, as are the jobs for veterans, trade assistance, and ex-offenders reintegration. 
The Department of Housing and Community Development administers the CSBC. DHS administers TANF workforce development programs. And although not a part of this combined TANF real estate plan, SNAP employment and training and refugee support services, also known as RSS programs, are a major part of the state's workforce development system. Uh, both of those programs are administered by the Department of Human Services. So with a combined workforce development system, Maryland's goal is to leverage existing resources, avoid duplication, and limit program development efforts to address addressing unmet needs. Next slide, please. As shown here, our robust workforce development programs are funded through three primary funding sources, including our TANF Block Grant, RSS, and SNAP ENT. Uh, these three programs total $48.5 million in funding. Our TANF block grant represents the largest share of the budget, and the program supports activities designed to help our cash assistance recipients meet work activity requirements and ultimately achieve economic self-sufficiency. RSS is used to address the needs of individuals admitted to the U.S. as refugees or asylees under Titles 207 and 208 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. It also supports English language acquisition, vocational training, and refugee career pathways, which have proven to be successful. And through RSS, Maryland has been piloting a two-gen model in the city of Baltimore. In partnership with the Judy Center and Strong City Baltimore, through this pilot, our refugee parents participate in English language classes and vocational training while their children attend preschool. The outcomes of this program are that the parents realize increased employ employability skills while the children gain language and other skills necessary to succeed in regular school settings. Next slide, please. SNAP ENT is the newest statewide employment model administered by the state. It debuted in 2015 with a budget of less than a million and has since grown to 12.6 million in funding for FFY 2020. We hope to continue to grow the program through increased investments from philanthropy, partnerships with our sister state agencies, um, data analytics to more precisely match services to customer needs, and improved partnerships with institutions of higher ed. SNAP ENT is well suited to address the needs of our non-custodial parents. And although there's no specific NCP programming under the current SNAP ENT model, each non-custodial parent enrolled in the program receives an individualized service plan that addresses his or her unique needs. The extensive data available to us through our university partner confirms that TANF leavers and non-custodial parents are oftentimes not earning living wages, and we're currently develop, developing processes to more seamlessly transition these customers to SNAP ENT to receive post-employment support. Next slide, please. Under Maryland's combined tanf Wheel plan, our non custodial parents, as you can see, have access to a broad range of resources beyond TANF. Each of our local departments are encouraged to utilize our TANF Program 10 funds to establish or enhance NPET programs unique to the needs of their local NCPs and regional employment partners. You will learn more about two of those programs directly from the local administrators during this presentation. I will now turn it back over to Kevin Geisblade. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Natana. Maryland's non-custodial parent employment programs are closely tied in with the workforce programs that Natana shared, most importantly through the funding. All the funding that supports our non-custodial parent programs come from TANF through the Family Investment Administration. The goals of our non-custodial parent programs include to assist non-custodial parents to remove barriers to financial and emotional responsibility through job readiness, employment development, and life skills counseling, to promote and increase the payment of child support through job placement and retention assistance, and increasing parental involvement of non-custodial parents in the lives of their children. The Department of Human Services Child Support Administration, in partnership with the Family Investment Administration, has been providing fatherhood and non custodial parent programs for more than 20 years. These programs help to build a stronger economy by helping non custodial parents secure and retain employment throughout Maryland. Our central focus is to support the children of Maryland, but in doing so, we find the need to offer resources to non custodial parents. The Child Support Administration recognizes that non custodial parents do may face obstacles that are sometimes significant in nature causing them greater challenges paying support for their child. One such program is Supporting, Training, and Employing Parents, or STEP UP, which is our largest, pro largest program specific to Baltimore City. Next slide, please. Legislatively mandated in 2016 as a pilot program, the Department of Human Services, led by Child Support, in partnership with Family Investment, 
along with various program partners, support and operate the program based on the funding that's provided by TANF, as well as from the program partners. Step Up is geared towards our non custodial parents that have child support cases and offers no-cost job training and support services to assist parents with overcoming employment barriers. non custodial parents have had, that have child support cases who are unemployed or underemployed gain assistance to overcome barriers to employment. Next slide, please. non custodial parents in Baltimore City are able to build stronger relationships with their children. A needs assessment is completed for each referral with individualized work plans developed to include employment training. Compliant participants can earn cancellation of state assigned arrears. Next slide, please. And this chart displays some of the highlights of statistical data of the participants enrolled and those who have been served from the start of the program in 2016 uh, to the most current data we had in September. Next slide, please. The success of Step Up is key to the multiple partnerships, as listed on this slide, who have been involved to administer the program and provide the services to the non custodial parent. Next slide, please. In addition to the workforce development programs that support our non custodial parents in all the 24 local jurisdictions, additional TANF funding supports several specific young fathers employment programs across Maryland. The Baltimore County Winning Fathers Program is designed to serve 250 fathers that owe child support who are incarcerated at the Baltimore County Detention Center. The fathers receive group and individual services to help them ready themselves for employment and reentry into the community. The Caroline County Parents as Partners Young Fathers Program objective is to increase family self-sufficiency through positive parental involvement in the children's lives. The Talbot County Young Fathers Employment Program assists non custodial parents through job placement services, parent education, health services, and advocacy services. And the Somerset County Parents as Partners Young Fathers Program tracks and monitors compliance for criminal contempt cases in accordance with sentencing and criminal contempt orders. Next slide, please. Similar to the Young Fathers Employment Programs, we're also able to leverage TANA funding to support several regional-based employment programs that also assist our non-custodial parents. The Washington County County Alliance Program for Employment, known as CAPE, assists unemployed or underemployed customers who have open child support cases to gain secure employment. The Carolyn County Reengaging Individuals Through Successful Employment Program, known as RISE, serves five of our mid-shore counties. The program's objective is to assist non custodial parents with securing the tools necessary to pay their child support and build a better relationship with their child and the custodial parent. The Wacomico County Non-Custodial Parent Employment and Training Program, known as NETWORKS, is a tri-county employment program on the Lower Eastern Shore to assist non-custodial parents with employability preparation, employment training, employment placement, and retention services. Baltimore County, in partnership with the Community College of Baltimore County and the Baltimore County Department of Social Services, offers job network program that provides referrals that they are received from the Baltimore County Office of Child Support for work eligible non custodial parents who owe child support for the Job Network Program. Next slide, please. Our non custodial parent employment programs have assisted numerous non custodial parents to gain employment and help pay child support. This is displayed by the increase in the total of our non custodial parents that are enrolled and the amount of child support being paid by non custodial parents in the many different programs that we offer. Maryland is making a difference for non custodial parents through our TANF Child Support Program partnerships. By working with our workforce development programs through TANF and the and Family Investment Administration and the non parent programs that we run using TANF funds to remove the barriers for, to employment for non custodial parents. At this time, we want to share more of a local office uh, perspective as well as program provider perspective. So Don Coleman with Taunton County's Young Fathers Employment Program will briefly share about the local child support office perspective and then Vernon Wallace will, from the Center for Urban Families will briefly share a program provider perspective. Next slide, please. Don. Thank you, Kevin. As someone that's worked in child support, in the field of child support for 29 years, the last 11 years I've actually supervised this program. I know firsthand how critical it is to have programs like this in, within the child support program. The overall goals of our program are to increase parental involvement through parental skill development, assist with barriers to employment, and promote and increase the payment of child support. It's been my experience in working with non-custodial parents 
that their primary focus is to be present in the lives of their children, and our program allows them to do this. When, pro when individuals are referred to the program by the child support specialist, family investment, community partners, and the court, an initial meeting is conducted with the customer and an intake form is completed in order to assess, identify, and address barriers to employment and self-sufficiency. The individual is referred to family investment to determine eligibility for SNAP, medical assistance, and in some cases, TDAP, temporary disability to adult persons. They're unable to obtain and retain employment to pay their child support unless they're physically able. Family investment provides that safety net. Additional resources are also identified and utilized based on the information shared by the customer. A plan is then developed between the customer and the program manager and worked through continued one-on-one -on -one case management to achieve the plan. Using a regional approach, if the customer is job ready and able to commit to training and employment, we complete a referral to RISE. RISE serves the Mid-Shore counties and provides access to training such as forklift certification through Chesapeake College and also partners with local businesses, for example, Dart Solo and Crystal Steel, to open the door for opportunity for our non-custodial parents. Since 2008, our program has enrolled an average of 52 individuals per fiscal year, served an average of 132 per fiscal year, 94% of those obtain full-time employment, 59% of those individuals retain employment that are greater than 90 days, and we collect an average of $141,000 per fiscal year. It's been my experience that it takes more than a minute and it takes a village. I'd like to share with you a story about a customer that I engaged in 2009 and fast forward to today. I met Mr. Carter in February 2009. He was addicted to crack cocaine, had an extensive criminal history, with 17 years in the installment plan in the Department of Corrections in Stamford, Connecticut, and numerous bench warrants in Maryland for failure to appear for child support. He was the father of six children with four different custodial parents. He owed over $30,000 in child support and he had no direction. His prior work experience was the street corner and side hustle. In 2010, he found himself in the local detention center for an incident that occurred while he was under the influence of crack cocaine. During his stay in the facility, our program engaged him through using the Inside Out Dads curriculum, an evidence-based curriculum that reduces recidivism. It is our outreach program at the detention center. Upon release, I watched him struggle to make the change. He learned to survive on what little was left after child support withheld 65% of his pay. He was referred to parent education at our agency to help him understand the value of being present in the lives of his children, and eventually it became a different way of life. Fast forward to 2017. He obtained his current position with the Talbot County Health Department as a peer support mentor, working with individuals coming into recovery, and is the custodial parent of his 15-year-old son. James is now passing it forward with Chris, who has reached his eight-month eight clean date. At age 32, it's the longest he's been clean in the last 20 years. He began use, abusing marijuana and heroin at age 12. Due to the opioid crisis in our nation, James and Chris are the common stories we now hear in child support. Without the safety net of family investment programs and community partnerships, there would be no hope for the next generation, their children. I will now turn the presentation to Vernon Wallace with the Center for Urban Families. Next slide, please. Thank you, Don. Once again, I'm Vernon Wallace. I am uh, working for the Center for Urban Families, which is a nonprofit located in Baltimore City. And we offer several services uh, that we help for the public, um, that we hold for the public. One, two notable services are our job readiness program, where we focus on soft skills, job readiness, and job placement. Um, and that's to remove any barriers to employment as it relates to that. And our second notable program uh, is the one that I personally oversee is the Baltimore Responsible Fatherhood Project, in which we serve over 300 dads a year. Um, Ultimately, what we want to do is provide case management, some workshops, and curriculum sessions in these particular programs, specifically uh, BRFP, the Baltimore Responsible Fatherhood Project. Uh, when we focus on case management, we have a heavy, heavy emphasis on barrier removal. So those individuals that come through our doors unemployed, which is about 60% of our fathers who walk through our doors are unemployed, we set them up and refer them right into our job readiness 
uh, program called Strive, which is a three-week program. It's from 9 to 5. You have to come work-ready, uh, professionally dressed, and it's three weeks. Uh, completing the three weeks, we focus on job placement, um, and it's based off of your skill set and your strength. And then we also understand that there are uh, over 60% of the people who come through our doors as well have some type of uh, experience with the police or have a criminal background. So we offer expungement services as well uh, with one of our local partners, NVLS, Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service, in which they provide, uh, they look at all of the charges for every participant who signs up, and then they, particular, they, they pretty much set up an application and apply for those uh, criminal expungements to remove from their criminal record in order for them to become more employable. Next slide, please. Um, how we engage our fathers is, is pretty much in two ways. Uh, one is outreach, in which we do street outreach and partner outreach, where we do, uh, as you see in the illustrations, we do community pop-ups where we'll disseminate information, uh, flyers, engage the community and whoever is interested in our programs, and we'll let them know uh, right there in their neighborhoods. Um, and then the second way is we actually go to partner locations uh, and provide presentations there. So one of the unique aspects uh, to us working with our local partners is child support is one of our biggest and most consistent partners of all, uh, in which uh, one of the unique aspects of that is that they actually come to our location and provide child support workshops for our program participants, uh, which is very helpful in addition to allowing us to have access to their locations to do um, outreach in the child support lobbies, which is pretty unique in itself when it comes to a fatherhood program. Next slide. Um, just digging a little bit into the partnership that we have with child support uh, a little bit more. Uh, we have a long-standing partnership and, and, and relationship with them um, in which we had some arrears reduction programs that we piloted uh, from 2013 to 16 called ROLL, uh, which has eventually evolved in which uh, Kevin was mentioned earlier in the presentation into the Step Up program, which has been successful up to this point. Uh, another, I would say, resource that we offer our dads as a payment incentive program once they're working. So once they are placed in a job, uh, we will offer the, the Maryland Payment Incentive Program in which once under that program, uh, it's another opportunity for you to receive additional reductions on your child, on your uh, state order arrears. Uh, for 12 months consistently paying your child support, 50% of your state order arrears can be eradicated, um, and you, you pay for an additional 12 months, the remaining 50% can be uh, eradicated as well. Next slide. And then just touching on um, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was a program participant in our program who was incarcerated prior to coming in. He enrolled into uh, the Baltimore Responsible Fatherhood Project in November of 2017. Uh, at the time, he was unemployed, didn't have too many skills. Um, daughter of, I mean, father of two daughters, had a very strange relationship with the mother of his children. Uh, fast forward into April of 2018, he completed this Drive Job Readiness Program and the Baltimore Responsible Fatherhood Project. Uh, is currently working at Black & Decker and Party City, where he holds two manager positions, uh, and his relationship with his daughters is great. One is in college and one is about to go into college now, and the relationship with the mother of his, of his uh, children is most notably uh, of great success as well, where they can actually communicate without having to argue. Um, his driver's license is back. He's driving without any, any concern of it being suspended, and he's not concerning how he's going to pay his monthly child support obligation as it's something that he does uh, consistently now as a result of the success of this partnership. I can pass this back over to Kevin. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you both, Dawn and Vernon, for sharing. The TANF Child Support Partnership here in Maryland is key to the funding and the resource sharing that is needed to manage our highly successful program. However, the true success is the dedication of individuals who are operating these programs in the local jurisdiction who provide the services and meet with the non custodial parents face-to-face, -face, such as Dawn and Vernon. These programs require a significant dedication of time, as well as the patients to listen to the clients and find the best resource to provide the needed assistance. Our non custodial parents desire to be involved in their children's lives and want valuable employment opportunities to be self-sufficient and to help their family. Ongoing education of child support workers, as well as for non custodial parents, helps to better understand the needs confronting the non custodial parents and ways to better address the barriers they face. Going forward, we have many opportunities available to Maryland's non custodial parent employment programs 
with the commitment and support of Governor Hogan and Secretary Padilla. We continue to seek additional funding and consider waiver requests to obtain approval from the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement to use 40 funds in addition to TANF funds already utilized. Enhancing referral processes and reaching more eligible clients can then be realized through future expansion and coverage of these programs across the state. And then by 2021, all three of Maryland's administrations, Child Welfare, TANF, and Child Support, will have all of our systems under one cloud-based platform as part of the Maryland Total Human Services Integrated Network, or MDThink. Next slide, please. It's an exciting time for the state of Maryland as we build this groundbreaking technology platform to transform our state's ability to deliver vital human services to all of our constituents. It's a first program of its kind and will serve more than 2 million mailer landers through the one cloud-based platform. Next slide, please. MDThing will integrate our state's health and human services application so that together we can more effectively and efficiently deliver multiple services on a unified platform. Next slide, please. The MyMDThing customer portal will allow residents, outreach partners, and nursing homes all across Maryland to go online and apply for a number of benefits on a single website. What's more, a customer will only need to provide information one time for one program in order to have the same information carry over to all the other programs if needed. Whether online or in person, a customer can have a worker assess all of their needs and connect them to the vast array of services that they qualify for. As a result, Marylanders will benefit from a whole host of services through a number of various programs that are administered across many state agencies. The platform also will provide state workers with the tools they need so that they're asking customers the right questions at the right time, thus ensuring they identify all of the customer's needs. And these systems will enhance the data sharing across the programs and improve processing and tracking of the data related to our non hospital parent employment program. Next slide, please. So in closing, I just want to thank, again thank the Administration for Children and Families and the Office of Child Support Enforcement for the opportunity to present alongside Colorado this afternoon. And I'd like to share with all of you about Maryland's TANF Child Support Partnership and the impact of the non custodial Parents Employment Programs to the families and children of Maryland. We certainly are going to be happy to answer any questions you have. And my contact information is also on the slide. If you have any questions following this um, webinar, please feel free to reach out to me uh, with questions for copies of information or even to schedule an on-site visit to see any of our programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colorado and Maryland. Operator, if you could open the lines and, and see what questions we have. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and the number one on your phone, uh, mute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted as your name is required to introduce your question. And if you would like to withdraw your question, please press star and the number two. One moment as we wait for any questions. Our first question comes from Tom Kamari. Your line is open. Yes, a uh, question for, I believe, Vernon at the uh, Baltimore Center for Urban Families. Um, I had heard in the past that there may have been some efforts at counseling both parents uh, on the reduction of arrears that are, that are not state owed, that are owed to the uh, custodial parent. Can you comment on that? Certainly. Um, when we have dads who come through our programs who have uh, significant arrearages or arrearages at all, uh, one of the things that we do is we make sure that they determine what is the owed to the state and what amount is owed directly to the mom. And in cases where they have uh, arrearages owed directly to the mom, we say, you know, well, you need to make sure that you have a good relationship with that mom. Uh, and if she's understanding and if you're already supportive, then you can ask her uh you know, get her a blessing to see if you guys can go down and close that child support case together, uh, if that's the case. Um, so typically that's what we would do. We would make sure, first of all, we would gauge the relationship that's with, in between mom and dad, just to see if there's any tumult or any miscommunication or, or, or things of that nature. And if everything's fine, then we would want to proceed with the next phase of it just to see what that conversation would be like. Um, it's been times where we have spoken to the mom 
Uh, but it sounds, it, but many times we coach the dad on how to communicate best with the mom. Uh, there are no additional questions in queue at this time. Thank you, operator. While we wait to see if there's any more questions, I did have a question for both sets of our presenters. Um, I heard a lot about fatherhood. I heard a lot of references about non-custodial parents. Um, given past experiences of my own in some of these programs, um, I noticed, you know, many times, uh, and we have a growing population, right, of our non-custodial parents who are actually the moms, and, and that percentage seems to be growing in a lot of the state's caseloads, can either Colorado or Maryland talk about any um, experiences you have with uh, the need to tailor services specifically to moms who are not custodial parents versus the dads who are not custodial parents or, or any observations about the um, additional barriers that either sets of that population might bring to the table? Yeah, so this is Dawn Coleman, Talbot County Office of Child Support. I can speak to that. Um, we, all, we do serve moms that are non-custodial parents. And um, at one point, we even had an outreach program for moms at the detention center to try to reach them when they're clean and sober. Um, mothers as non-custodial parents, and I won't generalize, but I will say it's my experience that especially over the last three years, it's been extremely difficult to engage these women and keep them engaged. Um, they are more prone to homelessness and to going back to the same things that put them back in the cycle. So they're, a, they're more of a challenge from where I sit to serve. However, our door is always open to any non-custodial parent that requires our services because we never believe that this time is the last time. Sometimes it takes more than one time and as long as they have a safety net, mm -hmm. I found that they are willing to come in and talk, and even if we can help them stay straight and employed for three months, it's three months under their belt where they're, they know it's the experience and their children have a hope of having their mom back in their lives. Thank you. Colorado, did you have anything to that you wanted to add to that? Yes, Chad, this is uh, Larry. Um, I know that our counties that do have fatherhood programs include um, mothers as part of that, and I believe there are at least one or two of them are actually looking to develop a mother-specific curriculum um, as part of the, that supportive uh, effort. Thank you, thank you both. Um, operator, did we have any other additional questions come in? There are no questions in queue. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and the number one on your phone. Great, I'll check back with the operator. Um, in closing, before we check back on any last questions, once again, I really wanna thank Colorado and Maryland for uh, their thoughtful presentations and for their time that they've invested in bringing this training and webinar to everyone today. Um, once again, a brief reminder, after Friday, you can go onto the KnowledgeWorks landing page and register for our March 2nd webinar um, about reinvesting child support incentive payments or applying for Section 1115 waivers to fund non-custodial parent employment services. And as I stated earlier, imagine partnering with your TANF program and together you can take another significant step toward breaking the cycle of these children growing up without the support they need and deserve. Uh, thank you, operator, any last questions? Chad, yes, our next question comes from Darlene Marco. Your line is open. Yes, thank you for the presentation today. Um, this is Darlene Marco. I have a question. What about um, services accommodating mothers maybe who were domestic violence um, victims or um, and as the non-custodial parent, but who are trying to re-entry you know, into the career field? Hello? Hello? Hi, this is Kathy Smith uh, as it relates to um, Colorado. I know that there are some motherhood programs uh, that are uh, are available in, in Arapahoe County specifically um, that have started to look at both custodial and non-custodial parents. Um, I don't know that they've addressed 
domestic violence specifically, um, but the the motherhood program that they have is not um, is not exclusive to those trying to regain custody or those that um, that have any of those pieces in place. So we, you know, they would have been open to working with um, with any mothers um, and getting employment. And then in addition, you know, I would say in Colorado, um, we would work with those mothers uh, to make sure that they were connected with other employment services that we have at um, our county and state levels, um, whether that be utilizing TANF funds, some other employment funds that we have dispersed to the counties. Um, I think that would be our focus if the traditional motherhood programs that they're starting to work on um, wouldn't meet those needs. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Of course. Our next question comes from Monique Magis. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation as well. We're actually operating a NCP program in, here in Virginia that we started early and earlier this year. Um, I do have a question for Kiki because she did mention child support, that they were able to get the child support paid, uh, funds that are paid to TANF families to go directly to the TANF family without the state keeping it. I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that as far as if, if these um, individuals receive TANF and they're getting child support, does it go? dollar for dollar, count dollar for dollar when you're evaluating TANF, or is it disregarded income um, and the individuals are still able to keep their TANF payments? I'm just curious how that all works with evaluating that as far as income. This is Larry. Um, Kiki had to step out, but I did want to share with you that um, our past due um, policy change um, pays the full amount of current child support each month that's paid. So. Um, over 3,000 families every month get on average about $167 per month. Mm -hmm. Our um, partners in the Employment Benefit Division that oversee our TANF program um, put a rule change in place to because um, the, the legislators sponsor as well as the um, stakeholders that were part of the legislative group were really concerned about the CLIP effect. So um, a parent would have to pay $500 per month um, consistently for six months for it to um, those dollars to impact uh, eligibility determination. Did I state that correctly, Kathy? That's correct. So that's what we put in place in our state um, to help ensure that, um, that, that we, we're not going back and forth and, and having family, families go off of TANF if a ch child support payment is made in a specific month. I don't know if I'm actually still open or not, but that sounds good. Thank you for clarifying that. There are no additional questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this concludes our webinar for today, and we appreciate you joining and hope to see you next time on March 2nd. Have a great day. Operator, can you give me a line count at the end? Yes, just one moment, please. Thank you. Important.